Good evening, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Nevin Gusak, your host of the uh, Politically Homeless podcast. With me is my weekly guest, Jaron Iquist. Um, a lot is ha- quite a bit is happening uh, right now in current events. So today we're going to talk about Hamas's aggression against the state of Israel and Israeli nationals, and it's turned out foreign nationals. Um, and we're going to talk about the angle that Russia and China has in this aggression and in their ties with groups like Hezbollah and Hamas. And I'm kind of reminded um, before we start uh, by a quote by bin Laden back in 2003, where he had talked about how <clears throat> there was this sort of alliance that should be between socialists and Islamists. I mean, he had said, there will be no harm if the interests of Muslims converge with the interests of the socialists in the fight against the Crusaders, despite our belief in the infidelity of socialists. And Carlos Sojackel, Ilyich Ramirez, um, what was his last name, Ulyanov, Ilyich Ramirez Sanchez, excuse me, stated in 2003 interview, quote, only a coalition of Marxists and Islamists can destroy the United States. So, Jeff, my question to you is, what are your thoughts about that? Am I some paranoid anti-communist lunatic dinosaur? Don't forget Islamophobe. Oh, okay, yeah, I forgot Uh, that. Okay, sorry. (laughs) Well, I, you know, this is where... You know, my understanding, like we've talked before, that people who adopt national socialism, who adopt communism, who adopt Islamism, uh, that uh, really violent uh, sects or uh, ideologies, uh, they are uh, appealing to alienated uh, lost souls. Um, There is a kind of joy in destruction and in killing uh, and as we saw with Hezbollah's attack on Israel, there's something particularly grisly about chopping off the heads of babies. You know, I hate to say this to the murdering, you know, burning uh, children to death. These kind of crimes, you know, killing civilians, this is so dishonorable. And there have been honorable warriors in um, Islam, Islam's history. You know, I think about uh, Saladin, right? Uh, who uh, really launched the, what was it, the uh, fought the Crusaders in the Third Crusade. Uh, he was sort of, through his uncle, became the head of the Muslim forces in Egypt. He really was a great strategist and organizer. So, and he was accounted a man of chivalry, a man of honor, right, who kept his word and, and you know, did not break these, you know, did not use treachery. Did not rely. Now I don't know if all of these this reputation is justified. Just as in people in the West, n- none of us are perfect, but at least we have this story about Saladin in Islamic history. And I I would hope that Muslims uh, realize that that the importance of honor and chivalry and these good things that um, that Christians should also realize. And of course. Christians haven't been perfect in history either. Um, so, but what we have before us in this um, this violence against Israel is is not acceptable, not morally acceptable. Of course, that's aside from what it means strategically. But the moral condemnation of massacring innocent people. Uh, and of course, this goes to the root of what the Jewish people have suffered since, uh, well, since since Roman times, uh, horrific wars, um, you know, uh, and of course the Holocaust and persecution um, for thousands of years, um, which of course, because in ancient pagan times the Jewish people were uh, monotheists in a polytheistic world. And then when the Roman Empire became Christian, they were not not embracing Christ in a world that was then officially embracing Christ. And so this this led to this long history. And now the Jews are, you know, back in their homeland in Israel. 
And the Arabs who had taken over the Eastern Roman Empire, you know, shortly after the time of Muhammad, who uh, who had populated all these countries that had been, you know, Egypt is no longer Egyptian. You know, the current day Egyptians are Arabs. They're not really the descendants of the ancient Egyptians. And you could say that about many places in the Middle East. They were kind of eliminated. And you, you go to Persia, the ancient Iranians, um, there are not that many, you know, pure-blooded Persians left, you know, because of the Arab invasions and the spread of Islam. And now what we have is a, is an atrocity. And, it, you know, what was it, 5,000 rockets, uh, a barrage that hit Israel? And you, you see the horrific pictures of, of uh, you know, uh, buildings, large buildings destroyed, apartment complexes. You know there were people there. There's people in that rubble. And I guess this morning, was it last night, I heard the death toll was over 1,200 dead. I'm sure it's going to be higher because they're picking through the rubble still. And, of course, hostages, maybe hundreds of hostages as well. So, um, so Nevin, you know, is there any sense in which, you know, you go Hitler talking about eradicating the Jews and people trying to say, oh, no. And then Hitler's relationship with the Grand Mufti of Jerusalem, who was a, an Arab Palestinian Muslim, and, and uh, who was going along with this idea of exterminating the Jews before there was even a state of Israel. So, so tell me a little bit, wh what is this Palestinian anti-Semitism? And, and is it, you know, we talked before about the Palestinians, you know, the, the Hamas people, you know, believing the protocols of the elders of Zion, a, a, an anti-Jewish smear, which was used by Hitler and other anti-Semites to justify atrocities against the Jews. It, you know, is, is anyone who points to the fact that the Palestinians lost their land, is there any moral guilt on the part of Israel? It, it, some people, you know, AOC and the squad are trying to claim. I mean, what's the story? Yeah, I mean, look, my understanding, of, and I haven't studied this aspect of the Arab-Israeli conflict in many, many, many years, but my understanding is, is that um, Israel was partitioned by the United Nations 1947 into an Arab, one that was controlled by Palestinian Arabs and the others by Israeli Jews. No, no, that was in 1947? Correct. And right. in 1948, when Israel became independent, you had the armies of like at least what five Arab nations attack Israel soon afterwards. With with uh, and they had uh, what French and or British military advisors. They had tanks and aircraft. And yes, the Israelis, right. re Israeli people had no heavy weapons. No, no, they didn't. They um, they even you know, they had what whatever was presumably left over by the British, whatever weapons that the Haganah as well as the Irgun, the two uh, paramilitary guerrilla factions that the Israelis. <clears throat> fought against the British and sometimes against their Palestinian Arab enemies, uh, fought against. They did get weapons uh, from Czechoslovakia, which was at that time a communist country, and declassified. In 1948, Czechoslovakia had just then only become a communist country. Correct. And in of course, Stalin, Stalin at that time, wasn't Stalin the first to recognize Israel? Yes, but there was a very uh, opportunistic reason. It's not because he, Stalin loved the Jews or Zionism. I mean, Zionism was persecuted by the Soviet Union as far back as 1919 um, by Lenin and his Bolshevik secret police, the Cheka, and it just got worse thereafter. Yeah, I mean, you were in trouble in the Soviet Union if you were identified as a Zionist. Yes, yes. Yeah. So Stalin wanted to basically use that to gain a foothold in the Middle East, and he believed that he could use elements of the Israeli Jewish left to create a progressive regime, so to speak, or a socialist government in Israel. What had happened was is that I believe he underestimated the anti-communism of uh, elements of the Israeli left. Um, <clears throat> um, you know, so that's kind of my take on that now. Um, 
this I know it's a side point, but it's an important point. Now, there was a report. It was widely reported in the British press at the time and the, and the Israeli press in the 40s. In April 1948, there was this International Committee for the Study of European Questions. It reported also that the Soviets supplied arms to the Arabs via Czechoslovak agents for use in Palestine. So they were supporting both sides and the Which Soviets. Is a very added, typical of the Russians, isn't it? Correct. Yeah. And it was also alleged that the Soviets urged the Polish and Romanian governments to send Jews to Palestine. And these Jews and the Soviets would always do this periodically in Israel. Avram Shifrin, who worked for the Soviet Ministry of De National Defense as a lawyer had talked about this. Jews were sent as KGB agents. Some of them weren't even Jews, apparently, uh, to yeah. subvert Israel. Yeah. Now, Ben Gurion, he noted in 1949 that already, and this was during the War of Independence in Israel from 48 to 49, that foreign and domestic communists in Israel were causing labor unrest and organizing anti Zionist activities abroad. He laid down the what I term in my piece, Red uh, Star of Jerusalem, a nationalist ultimatum to the rest of the Israeli left. And he said that, quote, the time had come for everyone to decide whether he is with Yevetskaya or not. And that was the Jewish communist uh, agency. These were not what Paul Johnson, the British historian, turns non-Jewish Jews. These were communists first and Jews last. And he's saying you either stand with the Israeli P Jewish people or the Israeli state or the communists. You have no choice. You'd be a traitor or a loyal uh, citizen of the state. TASS, which was the Soviet news agency, reported in November 4, 1949 that, quote, Ben-Gurion had gone over to the anti-Soviet camp of American warmongers and they call for the formation of a united front of the Mapam, which is a pro-Soviet party in Israel at the time, as well as the Communist Party of Israel to, quote, combat the fascization of the state of Israel. And I can go on and on. People can purchase the book on Amazon, but that's, you know, a little bit of things. So the Soviets had a dual game they never particularly cared for, uh, really any stripe of meaningful Zionism. Um, they had close ties with the communist underground in Israel. Now, concerning uh, the legitimacy of the Palestinian Arabs, in an ideal world, I wish the 1947 solution stood, where there were no Arab countries that attacked Israel, that the Israelis had their own state and the Palestinian has had theirs. But Golda Meir had a very, very uh, interesting look. And this summarizes my position on the whole Israel-Palestine issue. And you probably have heard it um, before, Jeff, and I think many in our, both of our audiences have heard it. When peace comes, we will perhaps in time be able to forgive the Arabs for killing our sons, but it will be harder for us to forgive them for having forced us to kill their sons. Peace will come when the Arabs will love their children more than they hate us. And that is my stance, really, that summarizes my stance on the Arab-Israeli conflict. And unfortunately, no matter what the Israelis do, they're not going to satisfy the various shades of Arab radicalism, whether it's the Al-Fatah, which is Mahmoud Abbas, or Hamas. The fact of the matter is, is Israel offered mass, and I'm not there. I'm not saying Israel is blameless that they committed no atrocities, that they haven't done bad things, but the Hamas, Hezbollah, and Al Fatah PLO, they are very deceitful. They are brutal as a matter of political culture from start to finish. They don't you have, have any real regard for human life. No, they do not. Now, when yeah. you look at the Palestinian Arabs, um, before Israel was formed, you had uh, the Muslim Brotherhood, you had uh, um, the Grand Mufti, uh, Amin al-Husseini, collaborated with the Nazis. There are photos with, with him. I've seen uh, pictures of him with Hitler. And is, is it true that he had blue eyes? 
suppose yeah i i i think he actually did you know what i i, I it's not yeah, something i really focused in that's on that's what i've heard yeah that but he yeah. was a blue-eyed arab yeah but you know he what appeared with Waffen SS troops in the Balkans. Mm -hmm. um, he has made radio broadcasts against English capitalism and Soviet communism and the sure. Jews. I've read those transcripts. Uh, he has called for extreme forms of brutality against the Jews, and that's why he was popular within the most radical elements of the Nazi party. And the Nazi party was a radical party. And and okay. Hitler, by the way, reciprocated this kind of mutual admiration with these radical Muslims because Hitler at one point said uh, that he wished that the German people were Muslims rather than Christians because they would be more dedicated fighters. They would be more willing to sacrifice themselves, which mm -hmm. is, of course, kind of a horrific idea that, oh, yeah, they'll let themselves be killed more easily. <laughs> I mean, that's pretty crazy. And, of course, in the wars between... Uh, the Jewish state and the Arabs, a lot of Arabs have died, you know, do, you know, doing these attacks on Israel. Oh, yes, absolutely. And Hamas is deeply unpopular uh, by some accounts uh, in the Gaza Strip. They are extremely corrupt. Uh, they hoard the best food for themselves. Um, and they, they use they use human shields. They use the, the, the civilian population as human shields, don't they? Yes, the Hamas has done that, as well as also the PLO Al Fatah. If you remember in southern Lebanon, the PLO oh, yeah. had a state within the state from 1975 until 1982, and they were incredibly brutal. And yes, they hid artillery, missiles, military equipment, and hospitals and whatnot. Saddam Hussein had done that. Why? To gain propaganda points. In fact, the book by the former Iraqi Air Force General, um, George Seda, had talked about that. And yeah, he, I read Seda's book. He was a pretty, he was a Christian Arab who served Saddam and then got out of Iraq, basically left. Yes, and what, and he had talked about in his book, I believe it was called Saddam's Secrets. I mean, correct me if I'm wrong, Jeff, or members of the audience. I seem to remember, I think that it was something that might have been the title. Yeah, I think he actually wrote two books, didn't he? Uh, I'm not sure about two. Maybe, uh, yeah. I know he wrote that one because I have it yeah. in my library, personal library, and I've quoted it in some of my books. And so they have a very bad reputation. Uh, you know, various radical Arab socialists and uh, religious fundamentalists, uh, so-called liberation movements of using civilian facilities uh, for quartering troops, for storing military equipment, thus making them targets. Um, you know, Israel is, for better or for worse, whether it's actually effective or not, they're warning Gazan Muslims and Christian citizens to really get out and go to safety. If Hamas was launching the attack, do you think Hamas called, you know, everyone, the Israeli Ministry of Defense, and say, look, every, we're launching rockets, you better get out and seek safety in your bomb shelters. No. You know, I, I'm really, you know, I, there are things I'm very critical of Israel, both from the right as well as from the other end at times, but I got to be honest with you, Jeff, I'm tired of people making the moral equivalence between Hamas and Israel. There is no moral equivalence. I mean, Israel, like other free societies or relatively free societies, they have their problems. Um, well, human beings you know, also can get, I saw the, what was it, the Israeli defense minister saying, we're cutting off the food, we're cutting off, you know, Gaza. And um, now let's just explain to people Gaza. Gaza is a, like a, like a city that came out of nowhere that is like a giant refugee camp become a city. What is its population? Three million people? Yeah, about 2.5 to 3 million 2.5 2. to 3 million. And they're, they're so basically right. like Palestinian refugees. And tell me if I'm mistaken, but it's technically Egyptian territory just on the other side of the Israeli border, right? Correct. Correct. You see, Israel during the 1967 war captured the Sinai Peninsula, the Golan Heights, and the West Bank from... Uh, from uh, Egypt, uh, Syria, and Jordan, respectively. Right. 
And they have basically through a series of peace treaties that the various American governments have kind of forced on the Israelis in exchange for basically helping to provide military and economic credits to them. So the United States says, we'll help you out if you withdraw from those territories. Now, in my opinion, I think that was a colossal mistake by Israel by giving up the Sinai Peninsula, the Golan Heights and the West Bank. It's from a strategic and psychological point of view. Mm-hmm. Um, I wrote in my uh, second book, uh, a section on how Sadat and later Mubarak used that actually to deceive Israel. It wasn't like they all of a sudden loved Israel and loved Zionism, but they yeah. realized that propaganda and psychological warfare. Now, um, let, let's let's touch on that for a second. This is interesting because yeah. Sadat appear, appeared to break with the Soviet Union, and he and Mubarak they they did this agreement where the Sinai became a demilitarized. You know, the Israelis had controlled the Sinai. They had made the Barlev line right at the canal, mm-hmm. uh, which was a logical place to defend. Right, mm-hmm. you have this canal, the Suez Canal. It's like a giant uh, moat. Right, you build yeah. fortifications on one side, and and in the Yom Kippur War, the Egyptian surprise attack crossed the canal, breached the Barlev line. Egyptian Third Army penetrated into uh, the Sinai to take it back. Israel was really in a desperate position, but they launched a, the Israeli launched an air mobile counterattack, captured the opposite bank and cut off Egyptian Third Army, which resulted in a ceasefire when the Soviets mobilized and 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 acted like they were going to intervene. I remember Nixon at the time, it was on the radio that Nixon was mobilizing, that he was calling everybody to the to bases. He was calling up reserves because the Russians were doing this. And yeah. this kind of brought it, when the superpowers got involved, it kind of brought this war. And the Yom Kippur War, what did it last, 17 days? How long was it? It was... Something something like that. Yeah, yeah. and it was in the, the fall of 1973, um, 50 years ago now. And yeah. of course, this Sadat made this, famously made this peace deal and you have made the point that Sadat and Mubarak were making peace, but they were getting such advantages that they were still thinking ahead that as Arabs, as Egyptians, they were still enemies of Israel. Yeah, I mean, well, that started apparently, according to the book, The Plot to Destroy Israel, and this was admitted by Sadat, uh, it was the Soviets that made this suggestion, unsurprisingly, um, using peace as a tool for war, essentially, as I would term it. In He's other words, having to, a having a fake change of heart about yes. Israel. So according to Sadat himself, the Soviets, quote, told Nasser more than once when he met them in Moscow following the 1967 defeat, go and talk to the Americans. During the four times I went to Moscow as president, they used to tell me, go and open a dialogue and talk to the Americans. Gromyko, who was the Soviet foreign minister at the time, also told Ismail Fahmy, I think was Sadat's vice, or Nasser's vice president. He was a very powerful name. Anybody who knows about Egyptian, modern Egyptian history knows who he is. And Gromyko also told Ismail Fahmy, Quote, the United States owns the essential cards in this game. This is a clear fact to all. And in fact, during 19, May 1974 rally of the steel workers, Sadat bragged that his government, quote, changed the American position in their unconditional support for Israeli actions. He viewed this change in American policy towards Israel as, quote, an Arab victory. Now, what's interesting is also the break with the Soviet Union. And that's very unclear in my mind now. There's a very interesting article by Lufti al Kuli in the government, Egyptian government-owned publication, which was its one of the mouthpieces for the ruling party, which was then called the Arab Socialist Union. Very well-known newspaper called Al-Ahram from February 11, 1976. And in that article, al Kuli wrote, U.S.-Israeli coordination is no longer total. In view of this, Egypt has decided that the political response to the new reality requires that Egyptian-Soviet coordination should also stop being total and be confined only to the general outlines. Otherwise, the US, Israeli-U.S. contradictions would not continue, meaning they would be still a monolithic bloc, would not continue, and there would be again an 
Arab Soviet front facing an Israeli U.S. front. Egypt welcomes a certain degree of coordination with the Soviets, provided that the Soviet reaction does not exceed the limits of Egyptians' visualization of the effect of mutual coordination between Tel Aviv and Washington. Now, Jeff, I'm going to throw this back at you. What do you think of all of what I said? Have you heard this before? What's your interpretation? I, I have heard it before, and it, it it rings a bell. It sounds very much like what the Soviet Union did with um, Operation Red Horizon in Romania. And Romania, of course, was the East Bloc country that was assigned to Egypt, to dealing with yes. Egypt. Yes, yes. Uh, that's important to know. The the defector, Ian Pachepa, had uh, made this point. And then there's a, this similarity to the Sino-Soviet split. Uh, because you, what you do is, look, uh, Soviet support for Egypt was pretty expensive. The Soviets put a lot into supporting the Egyptian military. I mean, the Egyptian military's achievement in the Yom Kippur War was incredible, given the defeat that they'd suffered in 56 and 67. The Egyptians came a long way, but just imagine the Soviets, if Sadat's getting aid because of the peace deal with Israel from the United States, how much is it a year, two billion? In Egypt, yeah, please. something like that for decades. Something like that for for decades, right? Since that uh, Camp David peace accords, where which was moderated by President Jimmy Carter, um, that this is this is rather extraordinary because because it means now America is giving its weapons or uh, and support to Egypt rather than the Soviet Union, which means here the Soviet Union maybe still has Egypt in a crunch as an ally. But now America is the one building up Egypt. Mm -hmm. And this is like with uh, China, we, you know, the best enemy that money can buy. I mean, we've been building up China since the 1980s. Yes. And, you know, because we thought they were an ally with us against Russia, which doesn't seem to me they were. I mean, you've done a lot of research on this, too. So they always, you know, this it's it seems to me that. Uh, Moscow and Beijing uh, and our enemies, including the National Socialist regime in Germany, they have this bag of tricks. They know the West. They know the Western capitalists want to make money. They know the West wants peace. And they know that if they just tell the West what the West wants to hear, you know, we really turn over a new leaf. We're really a good guy. You know, if, as Hitler said at Munich, if you just give me this one thing, I won't ask for anything again, <laughs> you know, which is, was just ridiculous. It wasn't true at all. And yeah. but they they don't turn over a new leaf. They still are violent and aggressive. They still enjoy murdering people and conquering and stealing and. And, of course, destroying things. Um, and so it it's. We, as much as we try to do peace, that we try to deal with these people, we just get burned over and over and over again. Yeah, that's correct. And there's a lot more I can read, too. It's in volume two of my latest book, Turning the Page. Um, you know, <clears throat> and it's also in my book, The Sadat Mubarak Deception. That's where people can get more of this information now. According to the archivist, uh, who uh, Pavel Stroilov, who smuggled out Soviet documents like Vladimir Bukovsky, according to Pavel Stroilov about Hosni Mubarak, the do Soviet documents revealed, quote, a different Mubarak, a genuine Nasserite whose true loyalty lie with socialism. And of course, you read Mubarak's speeches, as I had. The guy is a socialist. He believes in, quote, democratic socialism, who's obviously very authoritarian. Well, leader. it's an authoritarian. Look, Egypt is really a national socialist Arab regime. Yeah, you or know, at least Arabism, it was. It was a, a, a Nasserism is Arabism. And you have the same kind of regime in Syria. And they, they by the way, they don't really get along with the, with the, with the radical Muslims. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Because oh, yeah. they're they're they they may pretend to be Muslim themselves, but they're really secular. They're really national socialists. Yeah, I mean, Nasser and then Muslim Brotherhood at first had an alliance because of shared anti-Zionism, anti-imperialism, and anti-capitalism, but that eventually broke apart. But sometimes old enemies can be unified again when facing a common enemy. Oh, yeah, you know? absolutely. Well, <clears throat> you look at the PLO and Hamas. They compete yeah. for power within, you know, control of the security forces within the Palestinian Authority. Yes. But they are essentially, when it comes to Israel, they're 
you know, we're going to destroy Israel. Well, yeah, the the Hamas back in I think in the mid 1990s referred to it really their dispute. There's that despite their disputes, disputes, there's still wings on the same bird. I think is what that's right. Termed. And and this goes back to the alliance. I mean, Yosef Badansky talked about the the communist cells in Jordan. I think it was in the 1960s, earlier 1960s or mid 1960s, really formed a kind of alliance with the Muslim Brotherhood. So that so that you have this kind of cooperation among Islamists and the communists that is is now quite old. It's it's a half a century old, maybe more than a half a century old. And it's you know, you see it in Iran, you see it in um, in in the things that that are done in when the Palestinians work together with each other and, mm -hmm. and commit terrorism. And of course, I think that uh, that it's it's very much like because Arabism, you know, both the Iraqi regime, the Syrian regime, and the uh, uh, Iraqi regime, they were um, Baathist, right? Which is National mm -hmm. Socialist. But Nasserism really was very much the same thing, without the particular attention to certain ideological, you know, uh, uh, niceties. So. And that's from its era. That was the post World War II era that these regimes emerged originally, after after um, these countries got their independence. But now that Islamism has become such a, a rage, you know, and Iran has been working in the region, and of course uh, Iran is is Shiite. I mean, is 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 Shiite, but they do work with Sunnis. I mean, uh, what do you think of the the claims now? that Israel has made, that there's evidence that Iran was very much involved in helping to support this Hamas attack on Israel. No, it wouldn't surprise me. I mean, Hamas, the Iranian, the Hamas commander in the past has admitted receiving massive assistance uh, for Hamas's uh, military operations. <clears throat> and that is available on Twitter. I recently posted on my Twitter page under Nevin Gusak and uh, a video of Hamas's military commander admitting the cr critical assistance of money and weapons that the Iranians have provided. Both the Iranians and the Syrians have backed Hezbollah and Hamas, and Hezbollah has actually have been backed by, uh, by the Syrians too as well, which was always a uh, client state of the Soviet Union and now the Russian Federation. And Hezbollah has also been backed also by the North Koreans. According to an article from the Washington Times and other sources, North Korean advisors have assisted as far back as, I could trace as far back as 1990 in Lebanon's Bekaa Valley, there were North Korean military specialists assisting Hezbollah. Of, of course, Iran and North Korea have been allies at least since the 1980s, basically. And they, they yeah. sort of have this understanding that North Korea and Iran have this understanding that they they need to make threats at the same time, raise tensions at the same time to sort of cover for each other. Yeah, and, correct. And that's a that's a question that I have with all this happening. There's a war in in Ukraine, which the Iranians are helping the Russians with, and this this what is the purpose of this madness of this mad massacre of innocence. Um, what are they trying to achieve by doing this? Because militarily, I think it was the his, uh, military historian John Mosier who, in his comments on this um, attack, he's, you know, it has no military significance. They did not destroy any significant Israeli military or strategic assets by doing this attack. And they expended, you know, it's probably, there's probably 2,000 dead, you know, Hamas, you know, guerrilla fighters right now, maybe more. So what, you know, when all is said and done, Hamas is just, is going to be slaughtered, right? Mm -hmm. And and for the pleasure of killing uh, and dying, that's it? You know, what, I mean, can you think of, of the reason for this? Is there an attempt to ignite a more general war? Or is the effect that it makes it impossible for Saudi Arabia, for example, to be closer to the U.S. or to be closer to Israel? And that that's what this is about. 
Well, I mean, to be honest with you, um, I would argue that Hamas, Iran, Syria, they all ultimately want the same thing, which is the burial of Israel. The difference is, is with strategy, with Al Fatah PLO, which governs the Western Bank under Mahmoud Abbas, doctor who was educated in the Soviet Union, by the way. He's basically a communist, isn't he? Yes. And still backed by the Russian Federation. And one thing that I definitely would like to discuss, uh, at least for the last part of the show, is the Russian and Chinese hand in this conflict and their ties with Hamas and Hezbollah. Hamas wants to basically destroy Israel in a hurry, while the PLO al Fatah faction, which governs the Palestine Authority in the West Bank, they believe in usage of deception, which was the Soviets and the Romanians and the North Vietnamese, according to Josef Bitkansky, reported the North Vietnamese of the role in this, is to use the Western anti-war left, uh, similar to the, how the North Vietnamese and other communist powers used to delegitimize Israel, to make them look like the Goliath battling the David, the David would be the Palestinians. And the PLO came up with the phase plan, which was basically to make peace with Israel, to get springboards, little pieces of territory, and then also conquer Jordan to as well create what was termed a national democratic state. This is according to the phase plan documents of 1974. And they basically destroy Israel. And they look to how the North Vietnamese and the Algerians against in their anti-colonial terrorist campaign against the French, the FLN in Algeria, how they waged a war for the hearts and minds of public opinion in France and the United States to force the withdrawal of the United States from Southeast Asia and France from uh, French held Algeria. And that's what the PLO al Fatah did. But they all want the same thing. The way they govern their current territories that they govern is horrifically corrupt. It's brutal. It is definitely not woke. So any wokest who's like gays for Palestine that actually supports this, they have lost their effing minds. I think many in the Western left, particularly the United States, and I have to, we should talk about this, Democratic Socialist America and the Party of Socialism Liberation, which is an offshoot of the Workers' World Party. Uh, these organizations are interested in just destroying the West. As far as I'm concerned, they use issues of gays and ra anti-racism. And what I feel legitimate causes, that's not, that's not the issue. As our friend Jimmy from Brooklyn said, revolution is the issue. It's just this blind destruction, just pulverize the place and then let's create a horrific dictatorship that I think most people in the United States cannot conceive of. Well, this is the thing that I... That's you know, my when take. I, I, one of the things, uh, when I wrote Origins of the Fourth World War, one of the things I understood was that communism and all the related isms, Islamism, National Socialism, there's something about it that the people who adhere to it they want destruction. They want death. It's like Eric Verglund says, you know, I, I, I'm not going to, to approve of people who, who murder other people for fun. You know, is how we characterize national socialists and communists. That that it is that what they have created is they take a, a tragic situation or any situation where people feel mistreated. You know, the the Palestinians. You know, this is this is a tragedy for Palestinian Arabs who got caught up in this, lost their homes, lost their property, ended up in in the circumstances they were not like other Arab countries opened their arms and said, come and we'll take care of you. Right. Um, but th there's this tragic circumstance. And it's always these people who want to commit murder, want to create mayhem and destruction. They will latch on to some poor, sad situation, and they will blow it up into an occasion for committing massacres and murders and to, ins and, you know, inspiring violence. And it, am I mistaken in thinking that this is how the Palestinians are being used by their so-called supporters and friends? Yeah, yeah. I mean, they all have the same goals, don't they? And Israel is seen as a outpost of Western imperialism and the Americans. 
and their supporters, whether in the various communist parties here in the United States or socialist parties, or in Russia and China today, they are seen as basically tools to evict uh, the West. Now, Jeff, I wanted to pick your mind a little bit, um, some more, and could you tell us, based on the research you've done as well as the defector evidence, of the ties between Hamas and Hezbollah and Red China and KGB, neo-communist, whatever you want to call it, Russia? Well, um, you know, one of the things, you know, ISIS is an interesting element in this. And I had Russian friends and people who were following the, the Russian situation of Russia telling me, point blank, that the FSB was recruiting for ISIS. Mm -hmm. This is some years ago when ISIS was appearing. And if you notice, some of these ISIS leaders, they were from former Soviet republics like Georgia, southern Russia, uh, you know, Ossetia, Central Asia. Um, and and there's a, there was this, we forget that there was a these red Arabs that uh, worked with Stalin when Stalin was the commissar for nationalities during the Russian Civil War. Um, these... These, of course, Soviet Central Asia is Muslim. It's not Arab Muslim, but it's Muslim. And the Soviets created and encouraged these red sheikhs, red sheikhs um, that existed in the Saudi Peninsula. You have Yemen, North, what was it, uh, North and South Yemen, mm -hmm. which one of which was a communist state during the Cold War. And we see the violence there is continuing. And this is just sort of the continuation of the Cold War problem that was there. And you had always within Saudi Arabia, you had a number of these princes or um, little mini fiefdoms that had uh, Soviet influence in them. Even though the royal family, you know, met with Roosevelt when he was coming back from Yalta, mm -hmm. they, I believe they met him in Egypt. And that was when sort of an alliance was first sort of, sort of began between the Saudi royal family and the Americans. And of course, uh, what was it? Standard, uh, the oil company. Yes. Uh, uh, Standard, uh, what was it? Standard Oil. Yes, yeah, Standard uh, Oil. That's that, what that developed the oil, a lot of the oil there. Uh, and this was this was a very, you know, the, the this relationship was, of course, very profitable for the United States and for the Saudi family. Uh, and of course, a lot has been made of this, um, but but undermining the Saudi royal family, uh, creating some kind of um, uh, leftist or socialist movement in the peninsula um, has been a, a kind of a goal of Moscow and Beijing. Um, and you will remember in 1979, when the revolution was occurring in Iran, the Islamist revolution, and remember that the Ayatollah Khomeini's brother was one of the leaders in the Tuta Party, which was the Communist Party in Iran. And there's lots of stories about the KGB and the communists enabling the, the Ayatollah Khomeini's revolution in 79. At the same time that revolution was going on in Iran, in 1979, you had East Bloc trained Islamists take control of, what was it called, the Grand Mosque in Mecca. Yes. In 1979, right? yeah. And these were, they were, a lot of them were trained in Libya by East Germans and Cubans, yes. Yes. right? And yes. so it right. was like a double attack. There was an attempt to, you know, destabilize the Saudi royal family, the Saudi regime, which was pro-American and had this special relationship with us. At the same time, the Shah was being overthrown in Iran, which was a pro-American regime. You know, in Iran, people forget that Iran was a close ally of the United States, not an enemy under the Shah. And so these two things happened at the same time. The revolution overthrew the Shah since he had cancer and he was ailing. He, he, he didn't probably do what he needed to do uh, to stay in power. And he got overthrown. Saudi royal family. Uh, what was it that they did? They bring in French mercenaries. I forgot what they did to put down the Grand Mosque. Something. Oh, God. Um, they brought in some military experts that helped them. They did. They, it was crushed, and it was crushed brutally. But yes, it was a communist-backed rebellion. It was a communist. So see, you had the Soviet Union with its communist surrogates taking, trying to take over Saudi Arabia in 1979. I don't think it's a coincidence that the same thing was happening in 
Iran. And then what else happened in 1979? The Soviet Union invaded Af Afghanistan in December of 79. So, so there was like this major move by the Soviet Union to, get, to acquire these major positions to upset the, the Middle East. And uh, of course, uh, they had made a play for Saddam Hussein and the Syrians and Egypt to be their allies, you know, um, early on in, in this history. So, and then of course, China's role, uh, China and uh, the Soviet Union almost had this agreement that whatever guys we don't pick up, you could pick up. Well, they also found themselves on the same side too. I mean, South Yemen, yeah. which was the communist state, uh, the only official communist state in the Middle East at the time, they were backed by both China and the Soviet Union. Yeah, and uh, you have similar things happening in Africa. I mean, you have Mozambique yeah. uh, and Angola and Namibia and uh, Zimbabwe. And in Zimbabwe, you have actual North Korean troops yes. operating in Zimbabwe, supporting um, Mugabe's regime, who was yes. the, and Mugabe was a Maoist, right? Correct. The Soviets and the Soviets um, provided weapons to Mugabe's government during the 1980s and uh, aircraft and whatnot. Which, which um, is interesting. Mugabe, you know, the Soviets are supplying him with weapons and he's a Maoist. When uh, the yeah. Sino-Soviet split is supposed yeah. to be going on. So China and the Soviet Union back in the Middle East, yes, they helped Saddam Hussein, the Baathists in the 70s and 80s. They supported the Iranians and the Ayatollahs with weapons, both sides through intermediaries. I mean, I'm not going to go into the history for the sake of time, but, you know, moving forward, and you touched upon this, Jeff, you, you know, with the so-called collapse of the Soviet Union, what I'm seeing is this is really not a heck of a lot different. No. Like, for example, what I'm reading here is I see that Russia was the first country which recognized the Hamas government in Gaza and received Hamas representatives for visits in Moscow. In fact, today I saw a video um, uh, which was uh, shared with uh, shared on Twitter of the one of the Hamas leaders saying that Russia's on our side. Um, the Russian Deputy Foreign Minister Mikhail Bogdanov claimed that Hezbollah and Hamas were quote legitimate societal political forces. And in fact, in Stanislav Lunev, uh, Colonel Lunev's book, Through the Eyes of the Enemy, he points out that the Russians. Uh, continued in the 90s and in the 1990s viewed Hezbollah and Hamas under our best friend Yeltsin, I'm being sarcastic, as legitimate political parties and liberation movements. They've never, both China and Russia, neither one of them recognize Hamas as a terrorist organization. That's correct. Yeah. That's exactly which it. Is, which is really significant because when you, when you have an organization that is so terroristic, I mean, if there, if Hamas is not a terrorist organization, then what is? Yeah, no. It's, what it's, what it's is ridiculous. a terrorist organization, you know? It doesn't even warrant comment because it's the same old spoiled communist wine in a, uh, in a rotten bottle. Right. Um, yeah, there's more here. Weapons exported from Russia to Syria were then shipped to Hezbollah. In fact, the Russians themselves provided intelligence to Hezbollah during their clashes with the IDF. Um, according to Midstream Magazine, which is a Zionist but the anti-communist magazine, some very good authors have written for that publication. Now, now let me remind you what happened, what was it, three, four years ago, a Russian ship brought in this enormous quantity of, of ammunition mm -hmm. into uh, Beirut. And of course, this is where Hezbollah is operating. The Iranians are operating in Lebanon. They're using it as a, as a zone to deploy forces, and they're 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 of course aligned with Syria uh, uh, to the north. And of course, this uh, the the Russian crew, I guess, abandoned this ship, which mm -hmm. was loaded with an enormous amount of of ammunition, of explosives, and then it was moved off the ship um, into some kind of warehouse containment. And, and and it was it, it blew up, and it was like uh, it it had so much explosive power. It was like a five kiloton, five to five or six kiloton device going off in Beirut. It it mm -hmm. you know a mile away it was overturning cars on the freeway, the shockwave. Mm -hmm. You know mm -hmm. it did tremendous damage, 
And this, mm -hmm. of course, damaged, I think it damaged the, 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 really they had a puppet government in Lebanon that were controlled by, by Iran and Hezbollah. And, um, and that, that sort of upset there. And of course, I don't think, do we know why that, that, uh, that giant stockpile of munitions blew up? Was it that the Israelis set it off? Did it just blow up because they were careless? Do we know what happened there? And of course, that was all, that was being stored there to be used against Israel. Probably it was warheads for Hezbollah rockets to be fired into Israel. Yeah, I want your cut. It just the evidence piles up, and there's more. I mean, the even by the year 2000, as I was going to say, the Al Fatah PLO, the Palestinian Authority, uh, so called police officers were being trained by the Russian Federation. Here's something that kind of turned me against Netanyahu. This was uh, shared by a Republican candidate who I had worked for. She sent me some articles on this, and I was horrified. Mm -hmm. Hamas, you probably have heard about this, and I want your comment about this. Uh, Hamas utilized Chinese state bank accounts in Israel to fund their 2006 attack, in a uh, terrorist attack in Tel Aviv, where Jewish, Israelis, and Americans were murdered. But apparently, despite this attack, Benjamin Netanyahu treacherously, as I termed it, refused to freeze these accounts. He also refused to support an American anti-terror investigation against the Bank of China's connections to Middle East radicals after Beijing threatened to cancel a visit by Netanyahu. Jeff, I like your analysis on that since you're, uh, you rub shoulders with a lot of defectors, intelligence professionals. You've done a ton of reading. You're a great an analyst. Have you? I'm sure you've heard about this. And what is your opinion on this? What I term an absolute freaking outrage. Uh, well, you see, the thing is, is that Net, Net wasn't. You know, Netanyahu's is a guy with a military and intelligence background, right? He's a guy that that has. He's not just been a politician. He's also been an operator, and. So if Israel has counterintelligence operations going on with those banks, if they're following the money, it's possible that Netanyahu did that not because he's treacherous. He did it because he is trying not to give away an operation that's ongoing, where they would be shutting down their own double agents, if you know what I mean. No, I know exactly what you so mean. So one of the problems with, you know, analyzing um, people who have been involved in military, paramilitary and intelligence operations during their career and then become politicians is that it's very, you're in the wilderness of mirrors and what they are doing is not necessarily what it appears. Uh, it could be what it appears. I mean, uh, another disturbing thing about Netanyahu you know, uh, I think the um, Israel did some things in Syria. I forget what they did. They they bombed or they attacked something, and um, I, I don't remember if Russians were killed. But um, uh, Putin allegedly said to Netanyahu, "If it was anyone else that did this to us, you know, I would be I would not accept any explanation or excuse, something to that effect." as if the, the relationship between Netanyahu and Putin is a very special one. You may be heard, there's other stories along these lines. Mm -hmm. um, and so you think, well, Netanyahu is dealing with China, Netanyahu is dealing with Russia. Is he, is he dealing with them to, for his country to survive? Is he double dealing them? Is he selling out the United States? I don't know the answer. Yeah, I, I, I honestly I don't, um, and of course, it I am not uh, quick to denounce uh, uh, anybody from that spy game unless I know for certain by the contextual analysis that he's corrupt, he's rotten. It's it's exactly as it appears. I yeah, and I think that's a very fair counterpoint too as well. I guess 
you know, coming from my standpoint, I've just seen so many good people suddenly turn without any explanation. You have in West Germany, Franz Josef Strauss, who was a victim of Czech and East German disinformation, all of a sudden by 1982 was negotiating multi-billion dollar Deutschmark credit, swing credits from East to East Germany. Now there is evidence on, about that of possibly why that occurred, but it's not fully clear and we won't get into that discussion right now because we're not talking about West German, East German politics. But I just see the cover-ups by Western, including American leaders. There was a story in the Washington Times years ago about how China was backing the Taliban with military personnel and weapons and the George W. Bush administration did not want to touch it or pursue it because of the trade ties with wealthy donors and people in the Bush administration that had ties to the world of Wall Street and multinational corporations that did business with China. So you have that strong economic component. Now Israel has had very, very long-standing technology transfer agreements with the Chinese, which I think is not in Israel's interest ultimately because it's been found that the weapons that Israel has exported to components that are exported to China have been installed in Chinese weapon systems that have been exported back to Israel's enemies. Um, so that is a problem. Well, uh, the, the thing I mean, is, too, is this, uh, you know, and we've talked about see, the, the question really is one of corruption and the nature of the corruption yeah. and whether or not this corruption in any Western society, one of the problems with the democratic political system is that it is um, rife with corruption because the very concept of the political negotiation that happens even in parliaments, there is a, a compromising of principles of people that have different <coughs> principles, different ideological backgrounds. And so this introduces this idea of, well, what is treason? What are you betraying? What are you what what is this compromise thing? Which becomes in the modern context, I mean it it used to be everybody in a country was sort of on the same page. They all believed in the king, they all believed in the church, you know. There wasn't a, a, there weren't different there weren't that many differences. I'm talking about, you know, five, six hundred years ago. But it as modernity became more complex and people's thinking became more differentiated and all these ideologies appeared. And then you have the, the complexities of the financing of political parties and political campaigns and, um, and the opportunities to in, in inject money. And the question of, well, if you take money from this interest, now are you going to pass laws favoring those companies? See, we, we can't, I mean, ever since the, uh, the Gilded Age here in the United States after the Civil War, when the Southern aristocracy, which which had a concept of honor, which the the, the bourgeoisie, the money making classes, did not entirely share, though they had some, and it's become more attenuated over time. The once the aristocratic ethic is gone, and its principles are gone, you have this naked money making thing, and you're and and this is the danger of plutocracy, and of course. Um, you know, the Nazis and the fascists love that word plutocracy, but, you know, uh, uh, Vilfredo Pareto discusses it. And it is a, it is one of the realities. And I, I wouldn't say, you know, it's a it's a pure it's purely what our system is, because our system is very complex. You know, the systems that exist in Western countries and in Israel. And of course, I'm not an, I, I never did. a You know, I've studied French politics. I've studied German and, and, and British and U.S. politics. I've never really studied Israeli politics that closely. I've followed events. I've taken an interest in certain personalities and in, in, in historical events. But, you know, there is a level of corruption in Israel, Israeli society. That is rather surprising. I mean, you look at um, Moshe Dayan, for example. He did things that were very unethical, you yeah. know, as the defense minister of Israel, uh, you know, and he, he was the hero of uh, of the Israeli military for a long time. You know, he's the famous Israeli general with the eye patch. Right. Um, 
uh, and and you know you find out he was a bit of a rascal, right? He broke he broke laws. He he made money off of uh, uh, doing illegal archaeological digs, getting artifacts. That was one of his corruption games. So um, so with Netanyahu, uh, is he? You know, you've heard the stories. I mean, do you think Netanyahu is corrupt? Do you believe the stories? I, I think it's possible. I guess. When I read that, I just was so, because I held Netanyahu in such high esteem. And let's face it, as a side point, when it comes down to between Hamas and the Netanyahu, now it's become a coalition government, from what I understand, um, between the opposition and the Likud party, which is a ruling party, I stand by Netanyahu for Israel's survival. There's no question about it. So well, it seems to me that whatever one can say about Netanyahu, if he is is politically dirty in any way, I think he has been the most the best patriotic choice that Israel has had as a leader. Yeah, I, I don't on. think you can deny it. He is looking yeah. after the country's security. Now, is he going to be blamed for this? Now, I mean, the buck stops with him, right? Right. Yeah. And of course, there's also mention in the news. And the reason why I mentioned the Bank of China Hamas is the fact that China most significantly, though, obviously is backing Hamas. Are there any before I go on this to this question about this supposed leaked e Egyptian intelligence claiming they told the Israeli government before I ask you about that to pick your mind about that, because I'm not sure where I stand on that, because right. I don't. You know, that I'm not so sure. But do you know of any other instances of the People's Republic of China backing Hamas besides financing terror attacks? Well, I, I, I'm not an expert in Hamas, so I, I might have missed it if there was one. No, I'm just curious. No, I, I, I don't. I can't think of anything overt. Um, you know, the, Ch the Chinese and the Russians are very clever when they support these organizations. They don't like a direct, their direct fingerprints on stuff, right? They've, they've always been careful. I think, um, uh, who is it that wrote about, it was Viktor Suvorov wrote about this in his Spetsnaz book, about how using these terrorist organizations is something like, well, we, uh, they're going to do what they want to do. But we want to be have enough inputs where we're helping them, but we're not necessarily telling them what to do, right? Mm -hmm. And I think there's been other people, uh, you know, uh, uh, Pachepa has written about this as well, about the way the Soviets kind of managed some of these countries, like like uh, how they manage Libya, how they manage Egypt, how they would manage these, which are, are terrorist regimes. Um, and of course... Um, uh, Pachepa knew a lot more about Egypt and Libya than he knew about some of the other ones, right? Um, he so, knew Arafat, though, personally, was repulsed by Arafat Pachepa, if I recall. Oh, right. yeah. Well, Arab, Arafat, I mean, Pachepa had some direct knowledge of of Arafat's, you know, homosexuality, yeah. which I got the feeling when you read Red Horizons, he doesn't exactly approve of Arafat's, um, you know, uh, behavior of playing lion and the lamb with his bodyguards. Oh, no, he was, I read between the lines, it was repulsed. In fact, I think Pachepa said that he had to, like, wash his hands after yes. every shower. Yeah, there is, yeah, Pachepa was, 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 was repulsed. And I think there are, uh, you know, Arafat, the more you know about Arafat and some of these characters in the terrorist world, the more you are repulsed by them. Because there's, they're not really noble characters. You know, there are some deep flaws. I do know that um, Al Qaeda members, Al Qaeda, had done banking in China. Mm -hmm. You know, That's and this right. was this was evidence of Al Qaeda financial connections to China, Chinese bank. Um, but you know, with Hamas, I mean, all of these groups have these communist connections. You know, and communism is. You know, China, it's also the former Soviet Union, the successor state, the Russian Federation, which supports all the other communist states, and some of the African ones, states as well, the African communist states. So, um, you know, it, it is, they are, I would have to say that Hamas and, and Iran, even though they're, they're 
Sunni and Shiite uh, Muslims, respectively, are part of the communist bloc. You have to count them as part of it because when push comes shoves, when push comes to shove, that's the side they're going to fight on. If yeah. the World War Three broke out tomorrow, Hamas, Hezbollah, and Iran would be on the side of Russia and China. Well, if I recall correctly, Hamas and and or Hezbollah has backed the Russians in their effort to smash Ukraine. Yes, absolutely, they have. And so, uh, there you go. And of course, yeah. Uh, no, and, and that is not that surprising. I mean, you see that in some respects, Iran, the talent of the Iranian people, the talent for organizing, the, the talent for using technology, uh, in some respects, they have excelled the Russians, even though they're a much smaller nation than Russia. Um, and Russia has uh, really profited by their relationship now with, with uh, Tehran. Sure, sure. Iran has provided... Uh, drones, for example. Uh, oh yeah, a lot Russia. of drones, and and of course uh, this is a the, maybe we we're we're at a the hour and twenty minute mark. Maybe the the one thing that I would touch on is uh, the the one thing that Russia really needs now to pull its fat out of the fire financially is massively elevated oil prices, and oil prices are pretty high. They're mm -hmm. what around a hundred dollars uh, uh, a barrel last I checked. And what you really want is 150 or higher or $200 a barrel oil, because then Russia selling its oil through India or however they get their oil out uh, into the global market, you know, even if it's pegged below the market price, then Russia is making up the money uh, that it's losing in this war, because this war has proved to be very expensive for Russia. And of course, anything that increases tensions in the Middle East, anything that inconven inconveniences the Gulf states, pits them against the West because of their support for the Palestinian people is going to, you know, raise that the temperature in the Persian Gulf. I mean, is this possibly what part of this is about? Oh, I believe so. In fact, um, I found about a year ago, I think it was in the Washington Post where it was the Soviets that had a hand in pushing certain Arab allies into implementing the Arab oil embargo of 1973. Have oh, you yeah, definitely. There was a Soviet hand in that. Absolutely. Well, there's, it's a fact. I mean, I can... It's a fact, yeah. It's a fact. If you want, I can dig it up and read it to the audience if you want yeah. or not. But it, it there was a Soviet hand. And they praised it. The Soviet yeah. propaganda media, the Chinese communists under Mao Zedong, they praised it in their open source propaganda and news agencies. Yeah, they, the Soviets envisioned as far back as the 1960s and probably earlier that there were two critical types of raw material that the West was vulnerable on. One was minerals, which largely involved Africa, and the other was oil, which largely involved the Middle East and Venezuela. And of course, their, their desire was if they could control the mineral storehouse of Africa, if they could control the Middle East and its oil or Venezuela and its oil, they could get a lock hold on these raw materials. They could strangle the West. And that's been in their mind for more than half a century. You know, and you, I think uh, Shana mentions this in his book, We Will Bury You. He discusses yes. this in his, uh, on page 100 of the book, they start, he starts the discussion of the Soviet, the block long range strategy. Um, so, uh, yeah, I think that's important to keep in mind that there is this raw material strategy and China's part of this with its use of supply chain breakdown and 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 of course there's an attempt to corner uh you know what is it the uh, the, the china's trying to get the um rare earth metals the rare earth minerals thank you uh they're trying to corner them and of course for making batteries since all this global warming thing has put this emphasis on electric cars so uh they're they're playing this economic game this resources game and they're they're squeezing us at every turn that they can Oh, sure, yeah. Zhang Zemin, I believe, referred to rare earths as our oil, basically as a hammer to hit the United States over the head with. And I did find this piece of inf information. Um, this was during a meeting in Moscow, July 17, 1967, when the Soviet Premier Alexei Kosygin told the Algerian president at the time, Hori Boumediene, who was a socialist and a pro-Soviet, mm -hmm. And Iraqi President Abdul Araf, who was just, it was an Iraqi military socialist leader before the mm -hmm. bomb war 
when he took over. And Kosygin said, go figure. I have recently learned that in an Arab foreign minister's conference will soon be held. I wish this conference would set up a subcommittee on oil. Try to split the ranks of the imperialists on the oil question by supporting one country against another and follow the same policy and economic concessions. You can create great political problems for them and you should make great use of these problems. It's unfortunate that your current thinking is restricted to one topic. Will the war go on or stop? It's all about strategy. Yes. When I read that. It's all about strategy, Jeff. It's all about, you talk strategy. about strategy. What do yeah. you have to say? Well, yeah, that's what I've said for a long time. Look, everybody w wants uh, ideology, ideology, and, and, and repeating their talking points ideologically. No, really, politics is about strategy. It's about leveraging power to get what you want. And um, so I, I think that more strategy, less ideology, because a lot of ideology is just nonsense. It's just a rationale for doing the strategy. Well... Yeah, that's why I'm politically homeless. I'm <laughs> tired of the dogmatists on, you know, I like ideas of the right of strong families and entrepreneurship and national security. But, you know, as I've argued before, the right has is a contradictory ideology as conceived by William F. Buckley Jr. and Reagan. And the left, well, just see the latest iteration of the DSA and the PSL supporting mm -hmm. the murderers of Hamas. And, you know, uh, free, free Palestine to the sea, you know, their usual chant, which also the DSA meetings, they chant that slogan to as well, the destruction of Israel, you know, and it's with them. I mean, it's like, yeah, I'm critical of capitalism, but they want to throw the baby without the bathwater and create basically an international terrorist regime. That's just one big concentration camp. Whether it's waving the flag of Islamism or Marxism-Leninism, it ends up being the same old massive human rights violations, corruptions, and just every other horrible thing you can yeah. put under the sun. Murder, stealing, disgusting. I'm tired and of destruction. Tired. Yeah, murder, stealing, and destruction. The uh... well, Nevin. Well, thanks for having me. I I've got to. Uh, I think my my carriage is about to turn into a pumpkin. Yeah, me too. i got to get up for work tomorrow. We both got stuff to do. Thank you so much for Jeff. This has been a great conversation, a lot of information being thrown about. Everyone in the audience, thank you for listening. Thank you again, Jeff. We will hopefully see you next week. All right. Thank you, Nevin. You're welcome.